Hello everyone, welcome to IDU Moon Tutorials. I am Vidya Lakshmi and this is our third class on the video tutorial on database management systems. In our last classes, uh, we have completed uh, till the level of abstraction. In today's class, we are going to complete data independence, transaction management and structure of DBMS. So, by the end of today's video, we will complete our first lesson. Data independency. Data independency is the ability to change the schema definition in one level without affecting the schema definition in a higher level. That means we, we know that we have three levels of abstraction. So data independency is the ability to change the data or the data structure and organization in one level without having the application programs to be rewritten in the uh, another level or the higher level. You will understand them once if we start taking the examples that will be easier now let's see uh, the types of data independence we have two types of data independence one is the logical data independence and the other one is the physical data independence in the logical data independence it's the ability to change the data organization in the logical level and without affecting the programs to be rewritten in the another level for example like we uh, we have the faculty table, I mean faculty relation in our university database from our previous example, right? So now uh, I have deleted that faculty table and I have replaced it with two tables. One is the faculty private table and the other one is the faculty public table. For security purpose, I am hiding the salary of the faculty members in a separate relation. So in a public faculty table, I have a faculty ID, his name, the office in, his, in which he is working. And in the private, I have the FID and the salary. Now that I've changed the logical structure of the relation, there should not be any changes in the application programs. Uh, like the user who is asking questions on the faculty table before the changes and after, after the changes will yield the same result. Even I change the logical structure, there will not be any change on the answers that are retrieved by the particular user for the same question on the same data right that is what is an independence it is same with the physical data also i'm making changes to the physical organization or the data structures that are used for storing the data but still uh, there is no change on the answers that are derived or that are uh, given to the user Transaction management. Before uh, knowing how to manage transactions, let's see what is a transaction. A transaction is a group of tasks that uh, completely performs one particular operation, one single operation. For example, uh, if I want to transfer some amount, like say 500 from some account A to some account B, then the uh, set of uh, operations that I do is, first I'll open the account A, I'll view his balance and then I'll uh, subtract the amount 500 from his balance, I'll update his balance and then I'll close his bal uh, account. And similarly for B, I'll open his account, I'll add this amount, I'll update his balance and then I'll close B's account also. So these are the operations that means the tasks that I'm performing to complete one single transactions. That is what is a transaction is. Now, uh, since the database uh, allow concurrent access by multiple users on the similar data, or I mean one single data so this transactions must be managed that means uh, when we are saying it allows the concurrency con uh, concurrency data access we we are indirectly saying that there are many users who are accessing the data maybe the same table uh, simultaneously so there can be conflicts so we have to manage this transaction so that there are no conflicts between any two transactions that are operating on the same table or same data simultaneously. We have certain properties for the transactions and these are the, we call these properties as the asset properties. Let's see the asset properties in brief. First, atomicity. Atomicity is, uh, we have to view each transaction as an atomic unit that means each transaction we have to treat as a independent unit and it has nothing to do with the other transactions that are occurring at the same time consistency consistency states that any transaction must not lead the system to into a inconsistent state that means during a transaction a consistent database system must be in the consistent state only after the transaction also 
If any transaction is causing the database system to drive into an inconsistent state, that uh, transactions must be rolled back. Either it can be a, a hardware issue or it can be anything done by some user also, but these transactions must be rolled back. Any transaction that causing a system to go into an inconsistent state must be rolled back. And then isolation. Um, even if the transactions are interleaved, these tra interleaved transactions must also be managed as if they are working as a single system. Right. Durability. Durability is what is? Durability is that all the latest updates must be saved. Uh, that means any transactions after the commit must be there in the D DBMS and they should not be lost. And the transactions that are caused by the incomplete transactions and the uh, fault all transaction they must be rolled back but all the transactions that are committed must retain uh, in the DBMS and next serializability serializability is all about scheduling the transactions uh, so as to uh, avoid the conflicts between the transaction that occur at the same time like simultaneously so these are the asset properties that are really very crucial to the transaction management there are two important aspects that we should consider during the transaction management. One is the concurrent execution of transactions. Since the DBMS allows concurrent users to uh, uh, operate on the data simultaneously, we should, we should employ certain mechanisms for managing the transactions. First one is scheduling the concurrent transactions. We should schedule the transactions so that no two in, uh, transaction steps are interleaved. That means once a transaction is started, it should be, it should run to completion. Otherwise, it should be rolled back. The steps of that transaction should not be interleaved with the steps of other transactions. So we do this with the help of some schedulers. And the second mechanism we use is a locking protocol. Locking protocol is a set of rules that we should follow to ensure that even though the actions of several transactions are interleaved, the net effect is identical to executing the transaction in certain order. For doing so, we have two different logs. So every transaction begins by obtaining the shared lock on the database objects that are required to be read and the exclusive lock on the database objects to make changes. And it holds those data objects with it until the completion of its own actions. Only after completing its actions, the, the database objects will be available for the other transaction to complete their actions. So basically the DBMS will be allocating uh, the database objects to one transaction at any particular amount of time sorry any particular point of time so this completes the locking protocol the next aspect is incomplete transactions and system crashes there can be any number of reasons for the incomplete transactions one being the hardware reasons like the power failure or the system crash or some other network issues and all and the other transactions is the steps of transactions leading the DBMS to an inconsistent state. That can also be a reason for the incomplete transactions. So such incomplete transactions must be removed from the database so as to maintain the consistency of the DBMS. So the DBMS maintains a log of all rights to the database. Uh, that The main uh, crucial aspect of the log is that all the changes that are made to the database are first reflected in the return into the log before they are reflected to the database the reason behind it is if a system crashes occurred then the changes to the database are lost then the log can be used for the recovery purpose you can uh, read the uh, transactions that are successfully executed from the log and then you can make the you can recover the entire system to its original consistent state so that is the reason why it is called a write ahead log right ahead is before actually reflecting the changes to the database you are storing it into the log that is why it is called right ahead so you have another or a mechanism uh, checkpoint it is to speed up the recovery process when there is when a system crash occurs now then you have to recover all the uh, data from the log which is generally a slow process so instead of that you have checkpoint wherein you periodically take some data from the log and then store that into a database periodically so that when a system crash occurred you don't have to uh, recover the entire data yet you can 
सिंपली गो टू द चेक पॉइंट एंड देन रिकवर द मोस्ट फ्रीक्वेंटली मेड चेंजेस बिकॉज ऑल द चेंजेस दैट आर मेड बिफोर वर पीरियोडिकली अपडेटेड टू द डेटा बेज ऑलरेडी सो दैट इज अ मेकेनिज्म टू स्पीड अप द प्रोसेस ऑफ रिकवरी सो वी हैव कम टू द लास्ट टॉपिक दैट इज द structure of dbms and here is a structure of dbs dbms and directly showing it from the textbook as you can see the architecture of a dbms has three three uh, three basic divisions one is a database which consists of a system log so what is system log are uh, the data files and the indexes to those data files and the next one is uh, the upper one is a database management system which is basically a software that Uh, that acts as an intermediary between the database and the user so in the dbms we have a plan executor uh, for planning the uh, operator evaluation of the queries that are received from the user and you have a parser and then you have the actual evaluator that evaluates the queries submitted by the user and optimizer is generally used to reduce the amount of time and amount of space for the query evaluation so this this complete thing with this four components is called as a query evaluation engine in the next next we have file and access methods which is generally for the uh, accessing the data files for the processing purpose and next we have buffer management which is used for uh response to the data requests that are made by the user so that the data from the disk is brought into the main memory for execution and later you have disk disk and space manager uh, it is it talks about the uh it deals with the management of the space where the data is actually stored allocating space deallocating accessing files and all comes under this rest space management and then we have transaction manager for managing our transactions lock manager for implementing the locking protocol and a recovery manager for um, carrying the recovery process from the log and all next we have the uh, highest level where where comes the user so user is in, will be interacting to the dbms with the help of a web forms uh, application front ends and sql interface is nothing but the uh, sql query language prompt where we actually uh, give some uh, queries and questions on the database for data mining purposes and all so this is what is a uh, architecture of the dbms or the structure of dbms so thank you thank you for being patient with me and i hope you you understood uh, the concepts and this completes our first chapter thank you